Hey, God, for uh, when I started this trek for three weeks in a row, nice roads back and forth to Peoria. I think it's hilarious that last week John announced about the snow party, and there was no snow at all on the ground in southern Wisconsin. And um, I thought it was so funny because in Peoria, when I left Friday, there was no snow on the ground in Illinois. And uh, so God did this just for you, John. And for the teenagers, God loves teenagers. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I can't think of a better song to lead into this message. Of course, the worship team has no idea what I'm preaching on, but it's um, really the Lord. Uh, years ago, I asked the Lord, many decades ago, um, for a message that really, really uh, showed the gospel and grace. <clears throat> and um, I, I don't know if you know this, every week I've come up here, I brought two a good-sized duffel bag and another smaller bag of files of sermons. I don't know, maybe 50, 100, and just prayed before I left Carbondale, I mean Peoria, how, which ones to bring. And then I pray after I get up here, what do you want me to do? Last week, I had all these messages I was prepared to do, and um, the Lord had me Saturday write first things first, 10 new things for the new year. That was a message I got upstairs last Saturday night. And uh, and I would encourage you to get last Sundays and just pray those back to God because they're really excellent things to commit and believe God for for 2017. If you remember, some of those are they're really good. And um, all scripture. But one of them, interesting enough, I did not know this till yesterday, Roger took Jan and I out to eat, her and Sandy, and um, Francis Chan had a video, four-minute video, released this week on not letting your family become an idol. And it was exactly like that one point. I was like, well, thank you, Lord. I've, I've never stepped out and said that before publicly. I was a little nervous. And uh, uh, so always nice to get confirmations. Would you turn to Second Samuel 9? I want to speak to you about a message you've probably heard sermons on before, but uh, I just feel it's for today. And I, I actually felt... And I hope you understand this. God is a God of the individual. He loves the masses because he loves every individual individually. And um, when I was, the direction I wanted to go for the sermon this morning, I had a couple directions. Um, I was thinking in terms of the body. And that's good. That's good. And the Lord kept leading me this message. And the more I got into it, and I rewrote the whole thing than what I've ever done before as far as just tweaking a number of things. Um, I felt like the Lord laid in my heart, this is for some specific individual here today. You know, God would pass up the masses for one individual. He's walking through the crowds and he's Zacchaeus. It's all about him. You know? And the woman at the well. He, and we, we don't realize how incredibly personal God is. He's not just a personal relationship God. We have Jesus Christ. This is who he is. He loves every individual individually. As if you were the only one on the planet. And the most special one on the planet. And so I felt like this message, I think all of you will be blessed to a little measure because the gospel's in it. And gospel means good news. Amen? But I feel like there's somebody here today, might even be a visitor, I don't know, but this is specific. So in 2 Samuel 9, we're going to read the whole chapter, it's 13 verses, and I want to speak to you today about Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth. Then David said, Is there yet anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David and king said to him are you Ziba and he said I am your servant and the king said is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God and Ziba said to the king there is a there is still a son of Jonathan who is crippled in both feet 
That's an interesting statement. So the king said to him, where is he? And Ziba said to the king, behold, he's in the house of Machir, the son of Emiel in Lodibar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Machir, the son of Emiel from Lodibar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he said, here is your servant. I'm going to stop there before I read the rest of this and just begin to set this the stage. In the rule of kings, the law of kings in the Old Testament, when a king took over a kingship, see, kings had absolute authority. And there was the royal decree of kings, the royal decree of kings. When a king took over a domain, and it was now his kingdom, it was commonplace to kill every male relative of the previous king. Even the baby boys. Because, according to royal blood, that baby could grow up, that baby boy, and would have a right to take the throne back because his ancestor once had that throne. So when a king took power, he killed all of the king's men. All of his sons, grandsons, great-grand... I mean, they were killed. So they could not be heir to the throne because it had to be royal blood. So that's 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 the mood of this situation. So David says one day, "Is there anyone of the house of Saul?" And as you know, Saul tried to kill David. Saul was jealous of David, but God had chosen David. God chose Saul, but Saul corrupted, actually turned to witchcraft. And lost everything. Okay? He was fearful. He was insecure as a leader. In the natural, he had everything going for him. He was tall. He was handsome. He was bigger than most men. And he commanded, had a commanding presence. But he was insecure. Let's say this. When insecurity rules who you really are, down the road, it could cost you greatly. Jesus is our rock of security. Your insecurity is not a problem for God, as long as you keep it in God's hands. But insecurity can make people do things more evil than just blatant evil. One of the things I preach, a sermon that that I don't think anybody preaches, but I talk about how men lust for women's bodies and will take advantage of them and do all kinds of sexual immorality with women and ruin them, especially innocent girls that don't even know they're being seduced, and, so, and how evil that is, Okay. But well, the sermon you never hear is how women in their insecurity will manipulate and, do, and is just as evil to God to manipulate because of insecurity than to be blatantly evil doing something blatantly sinful. You follow what I'm saying? Saul was insecure. And I'm, I'm insecure. I think all humans are insecure. Sin makes us insecure. But Jesus is our rock. We need our identity in Jesus. We need to let him be our security. So here we have the situation. David's asking, is there anybody? Because we know how David Jonathan's relationship. Even though Saul was an enemy of David, made himself an enemy of David, David did serve Saul. David loved Saul. But Saul turned on him. You know, he tried to throw spears at him at supper. You know, he had to, you know, those are bad meals. You know, when you're there and the king pulls a sword to put it through your chest while you're eating dinner, you know. So David quit hanging out with Saul, <laughs> and uh, he was on the run for, for a while. For at least 13 months, he was on the run. David, Saul was hunting him down to kill him, because Saul heard the women singing, Saul killed his thousands, David killed his ten thousands or something, and then he found out that, and he was afraid that David was more God's favor than he was, because Samuel had delivered a word to Saul that was very brutal, because Saul had corrupted, and Samuel said, the kingdom has been taken from you. And so forth. So anyways, I, I want to say this. In the, in the spiritual, we know how David felt about Saul. We know from the Bible. But in that day, go back to that day, the average person in the kingdom assumed Saul and David were not buddies. And probably David didn't like Saul. And now that David's king. So I don't think the populace knew totally how tender David was towards Saul. 
Okay? And especially Jonathan. Jonathan saved David's life. These guys are tight. In fact, to this day, we talk about a relationship being plutonic on the most awesome level you could have with the same sex and not be perverted or immoral. It's a David-Jonathan relationship. We have prayed throughout our ministry that every man would have a Jonathan, David-Jonathan relationship. I have one with a guy named Reuben Ross. He's in He's been a missionary to Israel. Now he's in Texas pastoring. But it, it was amazing how God gave me my first David Jonathan relationship with him. And we are to this day. And um, I pray for girls in college, you know, that God will give you a David Jonathan relationship. Every girl needs a close girlfriend. They can spur one another on to God. Every guy needs a guy friend. And I tell you, that relationship with Reuben really, really changed my life. And really changed his life. Because it was a David Jonathan thing. It was birth of God. Uh, is in reality how we've known each other since 1979. We have spent. We only had two years together before he went to Israel, and then he lived in Carbondale for six months. We've only been together very little, compared to how deep our relationship is. We still talk regularly on the phone, things like that. So David wants to bless. M- somebody, if there's anybody left in the house of Jonathan, now, I won't take the time to go into it for the sake of time, but in 1 Samuel 24, 20 to 22, and 1 Samuel 20, 42, we're in 2 Samuel 9 here, but if we went back to 1 Samuel 20 and 1 Samuel 24, we will find that God, David made a covenant with Jonathan, specifically that says, I will never hurt your descendants and you will never hurt mine, and they, they did a pack. Because Jonathan's and Saul's line of kingship And David's in another line, and Saul doesn't like David, but Jonathan loved David. So he's in a conflict between his dad and his best friend. So they made this compact, okay? And you can find that in 1 Samuel 24, 20 to 22. And 20 to 42, also you'll see where David actually uh, said a similar thing about Saul, even though Saul was not good to him. Now there was a servant in the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. Ziba was a chief servant of Saul. But David inherited him when he took over the kingdom. By the way, we'll find out later on, but we're not going to get into it, that Ziba actually betrayed David later on in, in, in the life. He said, I am your servant. And the king said, is there not yet anyone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, there is still a son of Jonathan uh, who is crippled in both feet. That's a statement. He's saying something to him. David, you're not going to want to help this guy. Now, I do have to show you this. Would you go to Leviticus 21, and then we're going to go to uh, 2 Samuel 5 8. But go to Leviticus 21 first, verse 16. In Leviticus 21, by the way, there's so much revelation in Scripture if you just learn to cross-reference. In uh, Leviticus 21, verse 16, it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your offspring throughout their generations who has a defect shall approach to offer bread to his God. For no one who has a defect shall approach a blind man or a lame man or he who has disfigured face or any deformed limb. Or a man who has a broken foot or broken hand or a hunchback or dwarf or who has a defect in his eye, eczema or scabs or crushed testicles. No man among the descendants of Aaron three. And so what we see this condemnation from the law. That people with defects don't go into the house of God. By the way, do you understand the law is perfect? And the law demands perfection. And the law is not wrong for demanding perfection because God's perfect, heaven's perfect, and everything he does and says is perfect. And he isn't like imperfection. 2 Samuel 5.8. We're in chapter 9. Keep your finger there. Go back. Go to 2 Samuel 5.8. Look at this, verse 7. Nevertheless, David captured the stronghold of Zion that is in the city of David. Now look at verse 8. And David said on that day... Whoever would strike the Zebuzites, let him reach the lame and the blind who are hated 
by David's soul. Anybody hear that? How did David feel about crippled people? Because David loved the law. David loved the law. If God condemns them, I condemn them. They must be cursed. They have a defect. I don't want anything to do with them. I can't stand them. You got any crippled people? David hated them. So Ziba says, oh yeah, there's one relative of Jonathan left. It's a male. Uh, but he's crippled in both feet. Whoa. That's why Zeba said that. You, 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 don't, you, don't want, you don't want to deal with this one. You, I, I don't, you, don't want, you don't want to work with, you don't, want, you don't want to bless this guy. He's cursed. That's what they blamed under the law. You're cursed. Now look at this. He says, where is he? King David said, then King David said, verse 5, and brought him from the house, because, or he asked him in uh, verse 4, Behold, he's in the house of Makur, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Now, Lodibar is interesting. I did more of a study this weekend on Lodibar than I have the other two times I've given this message. Lodibar means a place with no name. It means desolate. It means no word, no communication, no pasture. These are all variations of the name Lodibar. It was known as a place where outcasts of society go and nobody will bother them because they're cursed and outcast. They were considered the uneducated, the unlovely, and just the losers of losers. And it's a wasteland. It's a desolate place. No pasture, no grass. It's, it's, nobody wants to go there. Nobody wants to live there. It's the awfulest place you can imagine. And this is where he's hanging out. And I'm going to tell you why Mephibosheth was hanging out there. Because he knew the rule and decree of kings. He could and should be killed by the new king because his granddad is Saul. Follow me? David says he sent and brought him. Verse 6. So first of all, the first point is the remembrance of Mephibosheth. David searches and chooses to find somebody that he can show the kindness of God to, compassion, favor, for Jonathan's sake, because of his deep love and commitment covenant with Jonathan. Ziba's name means appointed, stationed, or positioned. He was strategic. Though he wasn't, we found out later, a totally godly man by any means. God used him. And even in his statement, he's crippled in both feet, was actually a negative to dissuade David. God uses this bad servant. And an interesting thing is going to happen to this bad servant, nevertheless. Verse 3, Mephibosheth, we find out, is crippled in both feet. And if we go back to chapter 4, go back to chapter uh, 4, verse 4, we find out how he got crippled. He wasn't born crippled. Verse 4, now Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the report of Saul and Jonathan came to Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. He was a toddler. He was fine. His feet were great. They were perfect. Nurse picked him up to run because Jonathan and Saul had been killed. And now they're probably going to kill the rest of his pro their progeny. So the nurse picks up Mephibosheth to run with him. And it says, it happened that in her hurry to flee, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. So here's this guy, he's five years old, and he's cursed with crippled feet. Not because he was born that way, he was born fine, he's of royal blood. But his nurse trying to protect him and get him out of there because now they're killing Jonathan and Saul. Who knows, they're going to kill the rest of the progeny of that royal line. She drops him and cripples both feet. He had what happens when you have things happen to you you have no control of, and they ruin your life? They ruin your life and you had no control over it whatsoever. None. And you're cursed for the rest of your life. And out of fear, you go to the only place safe emotionally so you don't have to deal with society who despises you and safe probably from being found to be killed by the next king, Lodibar. Wasteland. 
desolate place of nothing. By the way, Mephibosheth's name means breathing shame. That's what his name means. Breathing shame. Think he felt cursed? Think he felt like a reject? Think he felt like God and man are against him and his family? Ever lost a lot of stuff? Good stuff that everybody average normal has? Mephibosheth, verse 6. And this is the rescue or the retribution. Is this the rescue or the retribution of Mephibosheth? David knows it's a rescue plan. But how could it be? He hates lame people. He's, he's loyal to the law. He memorized the law as a good Jewish boy. Or is it a rescue? I tell you to Mephibosheth, he did not believe he was going to be in rescue. When David sent his servants to get him, and they arrived in Lodibar and found Mephibosheth, who they know who to look for. He's crippled in both feet. His name's Mephibosheth. By the way, it's not a lot of Mephibosheths in the world, you know. <laughs> Breathing shame. So these servants show up one day in Lodibar and they say, Mephibosheth, the king wants to see you. What do you think he felt? I mean, life has been bad. The pits. He's still a young man. The day you die, the king found out, I'm of the royal blood of Saul. I'm telling you, one miserable life has gotten a whole lot more miserable. Can you imagine the trek from Lodibar back to Jerusalem, to the king's palace? What an awful trip from Mephibosheth. And I'm going to tell you, and the Bible shows us this, he was one fearful, scared young man. And how, how, how does a guy like that believe there's a good God? Oh, good. Oh, he'll never let me down. Never let me down. This guy's been let down by the nurse, by life, family, the new king. Verse 6, And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell at his feet and prostrated him and prostrated himself. And David said, Mephibosheth. Because I'm telling you, he came in and he's like this. <laughs> I'm telling you, he is prostrate. He's going to die. That's what he's thinking. I'm probably the last living male relative of Saul and a royal blood in me. We know he was scared. We know that's why he fell down. Because it says in verse 7, he says, here is your servant. I bet it was more like this. <laughs> your servant. Verse 7, and David said to him, do not fear. He's trembling. David says, don't fear. This is a David that hates lame people. He says, do not fear. For I surely, I will surely show kindness to you for the sake of your father, Jonathan. What? You're going to show what? Did you say kill or kindness? I'm going to show kindness to you for Jonathan. Because David loved Jonathan so. And David was a man of his word. And he goes against all his conviction from the law to not bless lame people because of his love for Jonathan and his desire to show kindness to his house. His own son, Jonathan's own son. It wasn't retribution, it was a rescue. I wrote this years ago, the first time God showed me this. Not only, what, not only was Mephibosheth not killed, he was shown kindness. Not only. Well, let me read this and I'll, I'll go with the rest of not only. It says, I'm going to show kindness to you for, your, for the sake of your father, Jonathan, and will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul. I mean, he's just happy he's not going to get killed. I'm sure he's missing half of this. I'm not going to kill you. I'm going to show you kindness. And oh, I'm going to give you all the property Saul used to have. King Saul. 
He said, and it doesn't stop there. And you shall eat at my table regularly. I'll bet you David had the best cooks in Israel. I mean, you take all the best restaurants in the world. David's table. He's going to eat at the king's table. He's been living in Lodi Bar. Probably eating scraps from the dump yard. And now he's at the king's palace. Getting kindness. Getting an inheritance. A king level of inheritance. Oh, and you're going to eat at my table from now. By the way, we know that David's sons and daughters were drop dead beautiful handsome. They're all studs. All the girls were beauty queens. And Mephibosheth is going to be part of the family. Come on. He goes on. He says this. It doesn't stop there. And so, so he says that, verse 8, Mephibosheth falls down prostrate again. Now it's turned from fear to overwhelming gratitude. He can hardly express himself. What is your servant that you should regard a dead dog like me? Mephibosheth had, understandably, some self-esteem problem. Maybe you have a self-esteem problem. I hated me so much in college, I planned my suicide to the detail. I thought it was because I lost my fiancé, because of the extreme hatred and rejection between me and my dad, which I'd had all my life, especially as a teenager into college. But it was really because I hated me. I hated. I hated me the place I wanted to kill myself. Alpine Park, 1973, June. God, rescue me. I felt cursed of God. You might be here and feel like that. He goes on. Verse 9. This is incredible. So we have the remembrance of Mephibosheth. We have the rescue, not the retribution. The reaction or, or the response, his reaction was fear at first and then it turned into a response of being overwhelmed. He can't even hardly believe what he's hearing. Verse 9, the king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, <laughs> now this is where Ziba gets his own here. How many know you don't get away with anything? How many know that if you're proud, God's got your number? How many know God knows how to humble anybody? That's what it says about was it King Nebuchadnezzar that had to go out in the wilderness and had like six-inch fingernails and he just became like an animal? And then he learned to know that heaven rules and God is God. So Ziba is not the best apple in the cart, okay? And so he says here, he says, The king called Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, and it's interesting he calls him Saul's servant because he belongs to David now and Saul's been dead for a while. But the Bible says Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I've given to your master's grandson. This crippled little kid right here, this pulper. By the way, I don't think he probably had nice clothes on. Probably hadn't taken a shower. Maybe a couple of years. Probably hadn't combed his hair. Ziba, everything Saul ever had, ever owned, it's all his. But it didn't stop there. He goes on. Verse 10. And you and your sons and your servants shall cultivate the land for him. I know you've been my servant, Saul's servant. Now you're going to be a farmer. And all that land, you're going to farm that for Mephibosheth. It goes on. It says you're going to cultivate that land for him and you shall bring in the produce so that your master's grandson may have food. Nevertheless... Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall eat at my table regularly. This wasn't just a one-time dinner. From now on, Mephibosheth gets to eat at David's table. Now, he's going to get all this land and all this food and crops and everything, and you're going to have that, you can own it, you do whatever you want with it, but you're going to eat at my table. Anybody say blessing upon blessing? Do you understand? Most people think God is a God who makes your ends meet. By the way, if you believe that about God, I did for years. That's all that ever happens for you. I read a book called Favor, The Road to, uh, Road to Success, and it said, um, 
I was I was in YWAM at the time. I got this book. It was a very supernatural experience, the whole thing. And the, and he said in there, he said, when it rains, it pours. When there's flowers, there's lots of flowers. And he talked about the abundance of God. And he said, if, you're, if you believe that God's a God that just makes ends meet, that's all you see. But if you believe God's a God of abundance, by the way, the first year in YWAM, I lived by faith. I had to have $50 a month to survive. They supplied room and board and food and transportation. But I had to do all my toiletries, laundry, etc. And I figured out with tithes, I need at least 50 bucks a month. I had to pray in. And the first year I was in YWAM, living like George Mueller, first time in my life, never told anybody I was doing this, sold everything I had, gave everything I had away when I left Rockford to go to Texas to this YWAM DTS. Didn't tell, nobody knew I was doing this except God because I really wanted to prove that he's a supernatural God the same as he's always been. So I figured out that's what I needed. And I want you to know for one whole year, Always enough came in for toiletries, laundry, and tithes, and nothing left over. And one of the things that hurt me the most was I was a big missions giver, and I had cut back all missions giving because I had nothing left. But I survived without borrowing. I never borrowed, never asked anybody for money, ever. I made a vow I would never borrow. I'd never ask anybody for money. If this is God, and God's going to let me live like this by faith, He's going to do it all the way, and I'm going to do it all the way. I read that book favor, and it gave me a revelation of God being a God of abundance. How many know God's a God of abundance in the Bible more than He's a God to just barely make sure ends me? In fact, that scripture is not in the Bible. But most people live that way as Christians. And that's why most people are real tight with their time and their money and so forth. Because they feel they've got to protect it or people take advantage of them. And Jesus said, hey, take advantage of me. That's what I do with college students. Take advantage of me. I am available. I'm accessible. I take college students out to eat. I always pick up the tab for everybody. Every time. I have a reputation. I like that reputation. Sound like I'm boasting. Glory to God. It's all grace. I read that book and I repented of my low view of God. I said, God, I believe from this day on you're a God of abundance and you're going to bless me abundantly. So I can start giving again, like I used to, to missions. God is my witness. In the next four months, over a thousand dollars came in, and I hadn't done anything different. YWAM girl stood up one day in our big meeting of our 150 at our base, and she broke down, and cried. Her mother just got diagnosed with cancer. She had to take a bus home to see her. It was serious, and she said, "Would you all just pray for me? I don't have any money, but just pray. I know God will provide." And uh, that afternoon, I went to her mailbox. I put a $100 bill in her mailbox and just printed so no one could tell my handwriting because it's so bad. I just printed, your Heavenly Father loves you. Stuck in her mailbox. But nobody was around. Next morning, she got up. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Who did this? And I'm sitting in the back, and I'm, I'm not a very friendly guy anyway, so nobody knew it was me. And, um, and I'm thinking, this is really fun. And that began my life. And I want you to know, from that day on, I believe a God is a God of abundance. Not a God just makes sense to me. But if you believe that, that's what you see. I see Mephibosheth, a God of abundance. So he tells Zeba, you're going to cultivate the land, you're going to bring in all the produce, the food, it's all going to belong to him, but he's not going to eat it because he's going to eat at my table with my food. Verse 11, and Zeba said to the king, according to all that my lord the king commands, his servant, so your servant will do because you don't say no to a king. All right? You don't say no to a king. Not going to happen. And so he says, according to all that the Lord, the king commands uh, his servant, so your servant will do. So Mephibosheth ate at the David's table as one of the king's sons. Here's Mr. Universe, Mr. USA. You got all these princes and princesses that are just awesome and Mephibosheth's eating with the class of the country and good food. I know it had to be good food. David knows a good piece of meat and how it should be cooked. I just know he had good stuff. So verse 12. And Mephibosheth Had a son. Are you kidding? Are you kidding me? He goes 
by the servants sent by King David to come from Lodibar, this awful place where he has just barely existed in abject poverty, with no future, no hope, a past that's negative, a present that's negative, and a future that's bleaker than both. And he comes to get killed by the king, he thinks. The king says, I've just brought you here to show you kindness, not to kill you. Not only does he show him kindness, he adopts him. He not only adopts him, he's given a boatload of servants. And not only is he given a bunch of servants and property, he's given all the possessions of a king, King Saul. Not only is he given all this property and possessions, he's still going to eat at the king's table regularly and be like one of the king's children. And not only does he get all that, come on, he gets married. He's crippled. Can I tell you, he was probably a normal, red-blooded young man. But he is never going to believe any woman's going to come into his life. I bet in Lodibar, he's never going to get married. What woman would be attracted to a cursed, lame person? According to Old Testament law. Wow. And he has a son. And he names his son Micah. When I looked this up for the first time years ago, I started crying. I started crying. It's all of our testimonies if we think about it deep enough. Micah means, who is like our God? Who? That's what Michelle means. Who waited 17 years to get our child. We adopted her from day one. God gave us the name Michelle, and I looked it up. Ooh, it's like our God. He'll never let you down. He'll never let you down. We're saying that. Oh, you might, you might get let down, but you're not going to stay down. Because there's a God that's looking to rescue people. The Shivashiv had a young son whose name was Micah, verse 12, and all who lived in the house of Ziba, all, who lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. In fact, in verse 10, it says, now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. So he's not only kindness, he's the Lord, sit at the king's table, eat his food, become like one of his sons, have all the property of King Saul. Ziba is going to take care of it, cultivate it, give him all the produce. He doesn't need it, but he's got it. All that wealth of that. He's got a wife. He's got a child. He's got 30 Five servants. Good day. God causes all things to work together for good. Amen. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate at the king's table regularly. I, you know what I think? I believe, especially when David came back from being exiled, Mephibosheth was one of the first ones that greeted him. There's a real touching scene there in the Bible. I got a gut feeling, though he wasn't a blood royal son, and he definitely wasn't as handsome as his sons, I just think David had a special love relationship with Mephibosheth. I think the God that was in David just loved Mephibosheth. But look at this at the end. Why does it end this way? Now, he was lame in both feet. He gets all these blessings. So crippled. Why didn't God change that? Why didn't God heal that? What's the deal? And the first time I ever did this message, I've meditated on that a long time. I said, Lord, what is the deal with that? Twice it says he's crippled, the beginning and the end. And he, he stayed crippled. God could have healed him. Miracles happened in the Old Testament. Elijah did all kinds of miracles. Elisha did too. The Lord spoke to me. You might have things about you in the natural you don't like, but God still wants to redeem every area of your life and make that insignificant where it's like your obsession problem. It's absolutely immaterial. Because Mephibosheth got everything and more any average human being could ever imagine, dream, or desire. Amen? Before I close, 
the real meaning of this chapter. Because the Bible in the Old Testament concealed is the New Testament revealed. And the Gospel in Jesus is contained in the Old Testament and explained in the New Testament. And Jesus says, you search the Scriptures for eternal life, and it's these that point to me. John 5.39 And all they had when Jesus told the Pharisees that. You search the Scriptures for eternal life. And they believed eternal life came from obeying the 628 laws of the Old Testament. They still, by the way, Orthodox Jews still believe that today. Nobody does. So they can't know for sure they're going to heaven because they know they haven't done it perfectly. But they still say that's the way of salvation. And what the Lord showed me was this. In the natural, you still have crippled feet. But let's look at it through the eyes of the gospel. Because God is saying, you search the scriptures for eternal life, and it's these that point to me. And throughout the entire Old Testament, Jesus is revealed. David in this chapter is a type. If you study types and symbols, you can get books on that. You can go to Bible school, take courses on it. David is a type of the Father. Jonathan is... Covenant relationship is a type of the Son. Interesting, Jonathan means God's gracious gift. God's gracious gift. Jonathan in this story is a type of Christ. Saul is always considered a type of Satan. Highest up, fell the lowest, lost everything, had a lot going for him in the natural, corrupted. Saul is like that. In fact, in 2 Samuel, it's interesting, I'll show you something really neat. In 2 Samuel 3.1, it says, Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David, and David grew steadily stronger, but the house of Saul grew weaker continually. Do you get that? That ties into Sunday school message. I was going to share this, and I didn't get to it. Let me give you a cross-reference and make it pop. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, O Everlasting Father. Under us a child is born, under us a son is given. And of the increase of his government, there will be no end. Say no end. Of the increase of his government. If you only analyze life for your human intellect and eyeballs and the media, you miss the kingdom by a country mile. Because the increase of the government of Jesus Christ has never stopped increasing for 2,000 years. And it's increasing right now more than it ever has in history. And it's about to take over. And the increase of Saul's house is decreasing. Saul's grip is getting weaker and weaker and weaker and has for 2,000 years since it was defeated on the cross. Saul in this story, Mephibosheth, is a type of Satan. So David says, no, God says, is there anybody of the house of Satan? By the way, everybody is born as a child of the devil because of sin. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. They said, they're of God. They said, no, you're not of God. If you were of God, you'd believe in me. You're of your father, the devil. And you practice lies and sin like he does from the beginning. You understand, we weren't born saved. I don't know what your religion is, but you were not born saved. You were born lost. And you're lost until you come to Christ. Now, I believe babies are going to be taken care of because of their innocence and their conscience isn't awakened. So I believe babies go to heaven. But the moment their conscience is awakened and they know right and wrong and choose wrong, that first sin, it's over. They're going to hell. You following me? I could give you lots of scriptures, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to give you scripture. I'll give them to you later if you want. Everybody's of the house of the devil that's human and sinful until Jesus redeems them, unless babies which are taken care of. Everybody's got to get saved. Zechariah 14.9 says, In that day, there will only be one name the name of Jesus Christ. There's only be one name. There's, no, there's not a bunch of religions in the way to God. 
There's one Savior, one Lord, one baptism, one faith. So, so, so David, Father God, said, is there anybody in the house of Satan I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake, for Jesus' sake? Because Jesus died for who? The whole world. Everybody of the house of Saul, Satan, Jesus, God's gracious gift, died for. And the Father says, I want them all. I'm not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. So we have a God that's looking for every Mephibosheth he can find. No matter how low and cursed their life may be and feel, and their destiny bleak, And for Jesus' sake. See, he didn't save us because we were worthy. You didn't get born again and the Holy Spirit revealed Jesus to you because you were such a good person. Or you were so handsome. Or she was so intelligent. No, no. It was grace. It was unmerited favor. It was just God's kindness wanting to be shown. For Jesus' sake. Because he made There's a covenant. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died for everybody. And and David sent out servants. God the Father sends out servants, angels and workers, to bring them to himself. And you know, when a sinner first is being brought, which is happening right now in America, a lot of hardcore sinners don't know it, but angels and servants of God that are being unleashed and the Holy Spirit are drawing them to Jesus. They don't know that yet, but what they're really scared of is not politics or a president. What they're afraid of is God is about to capture a whole lot of people in a really huge way. And the Holy Spirit is breathing down the necks of every atheist and every anti-Christian or unchristian person in some form or fashion because we're about to have a harvest, a great awakening. And what's going to happen when the Holy Spirit starts really bringing them in? They're going to be scared to death. But they're going to find out when they meet him all their sins are forgiven instead of fear they're going to have perfect love casting it out instead of alienation they're going to have this supernatural peace that guards their heart and mind and is beyond comprehension and then on top of that he's going to pour out gifts on them and power in his presence and every kind of blessing did God ever overwhelm you when you got saved I'll tell you overwhelm me because if it didn't happen in salvation it sure happened with the baptism of the Holy Spirit And it's still happening. And you know what? We're all going to sit at the king's table and eat regularly forever. I'm telling you, the food in heaven is good. In fact, I think it's like perfect. I think like every meal, every morsel, every bite will be like... (sighs) It's going to be awesome. And we got like all the angels on our side. As servants, are they not all ministering angels rendered to those who inherit salvation? Hebrews 1.14. you got all the angels on your side? you got all the inherit. You are co-heirs with Jesus? Your, your progeny of Jesus, like Mephibosheth was Jonathan and inherited everything that came through the royal line of Saul? You have everything that comes through the royal line of Jesus. That's how big your inheritance is. And it's already began. It's already started. It doesn't have to wait till after you die. You can start tapping into it now. Amen? And what do we want? We want a new car. That's fine. God will get you a new car. We want a new house. That's fine. God will give you a house. But there's greater inheritance than things. Get the things! But let your life influence people for the kingdom forever. The greatest fulfillment you ever have is that God uses your life to touch somebody and they're changed forever. God used you to change somebody's life for Jesus' sake forever. There's no greater fulfillment than your life influencing somebody to God. The greatest thing. So, why was he so crippled in two feet? Because he never changed his feet. And you know what? There might be things about you you don't like. I'm too tall. I'm too short. I'm too fat. I'm too skinny. I don't like the color of my hair. And my hair is too stringy. My hair is too curly. My hair is too straight. I don't have any hair. <laughs> I lost it all. <laughs> so what? You're eating at the king's table. 
You got the king's inheritance. You got mega amount of servants in the heavenlies. We should have been killed. We should be despised. Because our crippledness isn't feet, it's sin. Damaged character, so forth. So, if something you don't like about your life, like what Gothard says, like crippled feet, are marks of ownership to God. Because you belong to God. And if God let that stay there, that's your ownership to God. But we care so much more about what the world thinks about us. We care so much about human opinions of us. But I'm telling you, when you get free of human opinion and human desires of what other people think you should be like, and you're totally content that God loves me unconditionally, totally, just the way I am, forever. You are loved and accepted unconditionally through Jesus Christ by the Father forever. Forever. And as long as you're in this life, by the way, Mephibosheth has good feet in heaven. I bet when he comes up to us, he'll go, Hi, my name is Mephibosheth. He's dumping and dancing. So it's only a temporary time you have that affliction. This life. Heaven's forever. Let it sink in, gang. The greatest news on planet Earth is the gospel. God so loved us. He gave His only Son. Made a covenant with His blood. That whosoever believe in Him gets eternal life. Oh no, it's more and more eternal life. We sit at the King's table. We have... Our eye is not seen, ear is not heard, nor is it even entered into the heart of man. You can't, if you sat down for 10 hours and tried to think of the most fantastic things you could ever get, receive, and have in your life and forever, God says, beyond that. And by the way, if you say, I used to do, I do this with college kids. I said, sit down, spend an hour or two, and try to think of what the most perfect relationship with Father would be like. And He's better than you could dream. He loves you more than you could imagine. The Bible says in Ephesians 3.19 that we might know, experience the love of God that surpasses knowledge. So it says, Ephesians 3.19, that we might know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. So as much as you try to think about it, receive it, and take it in and experience it, it's still beyond that. Yea, I've loved you with an eternal, everlasting love and drawn you to myself by my loving kindness. Your sonship, your daughtership. You're in. You won! (laughs) Packers lost! I'm so sad. But you won! Because there won't probably be football in heaven. No, there'll be something better. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't God good? Would you bow your, eye, bow your heads and close your eyes, please? Father, I just pray right now, if you're here today, if you are that individual that really has felt rejected, really felt like you even didn't have control over the things in your life that make you feel cursed, and have wondered how God could possibly love you, He brought you here today just to tell you that He loves you, and you're as special to Him as any human being could ever be. He wants to show you kindness. He wants to forgive. He wants to cleanse. He wants to bless you beyond your wildest imagining. With His love, with His acceptance, and with blessings, even in the natural, that you could never have imagined would come into your life. We don't come to Christ to get the physical blessings. We come to Christ because He is who He is, and we need Him. So I wonder, with every eye closed and every head bowed, is there anybody here today You have felt, like Mephibosheth, his name means breathing shame. And you have been so low. God bless you. I see that hand. You can put it down. God bless you. I see that hand. Anybody else? Yes, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. Yes, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Lots of hands. 
This message was for you that lifted your hands. Is there anybody else? Just lift your hand. God bless you. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I remember when I hated myself and wanted to die. I hated my looks. I hated my body. I hated my personality. I hated my family. I hated... I just felt so cursed. Such a loser. But I thank you, Lord, it's these that you send out your servants to bring to yourself, to show them kindness, to give them your unconditional love and acceptance, to bring them to your table to eat, and then to bless them and prosper them beyond anything they could imagine. And even if they have crippled feet and they don't ever change in this life. Thank you for the hope of heaven that there will be changed in the next life. I want to ask you right now, you that raised your hands and those that also needed to, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer to receive what God has for you. This was a personal word God told me to somebody. And obviously there were several that raised their hand and God will come to each of you personally to give it to you and He has. I want you to receive. Mephibosheth received and when he received, that instilled in him the response, who is like our God? And that's what he named his first son. And God wants to so overwhelm you with his goodness and his love, his forgiveness, his mercy and kindness, that all you can say is, who is like our God? And everything you've hated about your life, hated about yourself, hated about your past, is all going to wash away like a fog on a foggy day disappearing by the sunshine when you see him and how he is towards you. Follow me out loud or silently, whatever is your desire. Those who want to pray and receive God's grace through Christ, the Father wants you to have and have in its fullness. Follow me out loud or silently. Dear Jesus, I believe. You came searching for me. Not to destroy me. To save me. Forgive me. Heal me. And bless me. Thank you. That all of my problems. All of my curses. All of my past. Is under your blood. And you became my curse on the cross. I receive today all of your love for me. All of your kingly inheritance. All of your acceptance, kindness, and blessing. That relationship to you. I thank you that my unloveliness doesn't stop your love even makes you love me more change my life Lord I want to know you as the abundant God you are abundant in grace favor love and you'll never change I thank you your kingdom is always increasing and I ask you to let it increase in me Thank you, Jesus. One more prayer. If there's anybody here, keep your heads bowed. If you don't know Jesus, you've never received him, you've never repented and gotten off the throne of your life and quit living supremely for self and said, Jesus, I believe you're God and I believe you could run my life better than I can and I want to repent of my sins and acknowledge you died on the cross to save me and I want to acknowledge that and I want to receive what you did on the cross for me and then receive you into my life as my Lord and Savior, living in me by the Holy Spirit and walking in faith in you for the rest of my life. Because I believe you can run my life better than I can. If that's you today and you don't know Jesus or you're backslidden and you need to give your whole heart to Christ, would you slip your hand up right now and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to be right with God. I want Jesus Christ in my life. Is there anybody I wouldn't want to miss? Is there anybody that needs to receive Christ today? God bless you. I want to greet my precious friends from Rockford that are here. Love you guys. Roger or John.
You're not. He's not working yet. John. Hey, let's give the Lord a. This, this is this is your father. This is your king. You're in. You eat at his table. All this inheritance is yours now. Amen. Let's praise the Lord. Let's stand up and praise the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Dale, thank you so much for uh, being here and thank you for all that you've poured into us and blessing us. So, And uh, if you've been blessed by Dale, I just want to encourage you to bless him, uh, both spiritually by praying for him and um, financially. So again, there's a bucket up here. There's one at the door. And um, you can just put that in for Dale and be a blessing to him. So thank you guys for being here. Have an awesome day. Enjoy the Lord. Amen.